Hi, and welcome to the LMG November webinar, Beyond Passwords, Two-Factor Authentication, Biometrics, and more. My name is Natalie Adams, and I am your moderator for today. Before we start the program, I would like to give you some housekeeping information. First, we encourage attendees to use the computer audio feature of this webinar. During the program, should you experience any audio interference, such as static or intermittent audio due to a busy network, please use the optional phone connection, which is listed in the audio tab of the webinar interface. Second, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the program. You may submit questions anytime by using the QA tab in the webinar interface, or you can save them until the end. Next, the video of the webinar and handouts will be available after the event. All attendees will receive a notification once the video is live, which also include links to the supplemental files. Please feel free to download for your reference later on. And last, but certainly not least, a survey will be available to you at the conclusion of this webinar. Please take the opportunity to provide feedback on your webinar experience. Our presenter for the webinar today is Matt Duran. Matt Duran is the Incidents Response Team Manager for LMG Security. He is an instructor at the International Black Hat USA Conference, where he teaches data breaches. A seasoned forensics professional, Matt specializes in incident response, ransomware cases, cryptojacking, and banking trojans. Matt holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Montana and previously worked as a blue team field technician and system administrator for over 10 years. His malware research has been featured on NBC Nightly News. And at this time, Matt, I am passing you control of the webinar. Thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you everyone for joining today. So we'd uh, we'd like to start off the webinar with uh, you know a little bit of lightheartedness because we are talking about a, a fairly dense and heavy subject, and uh, this is uh, something that's of a lot of concern for a lot of people during the rush to work from home that's happened with the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the associated kind of tech issues that have gone along with that. So we, we like to, to talk to people about their pets' names and, and remind them that uh, you can name your pets whatever you want, but be sure it's something you can remember because you'll be using them as security questions for the rest of your life. Uh, to start off, we'll talk about uh, a pretty interesting example that came up recently of how the need for authentication and the ability to safely store passwords can really make a large difference financially for uh, for companies. Uh, the the example we're going to use here is a an FBI crime involving corporate bill pay and an attack against that system. Hackers targeted financial institutions and three individual clients from the institutions. Uh, after an investigation, it was noted that about 4,000 online banking accounts were potentially compromised in this attack specifically. The attackers used bill pay and sent money to themselves wired through foreign bank accounts. Overall losses for this uh, specific attack were right about $40,000 for the clients involved. Most of that money was right out the door and not able to be recovered. And security researchers uh, identified more than 1,500 email addresses and 6,000 passwords exposed in more than 80 data breaches that were used to facilitate this attack. This is an example of a credential stuffing attack that was successfully executed against these clients. And it's something we'll talk about as we move in through the authentication portions of this presentation. Hopefully we can make a little bit more sense of that, give you some really good tips on how to protect yourself, make sure something like this doesn't happen to you. So our roadmap for today, we'll talk about passwords uh, and how much everyone loves them, some tips that we can uh, we can implement to make them a little bit easier for people to use, uh, a little bit more streamlined for your environment. Uh, we'll talk about credential stuffing attacks, application-based attacks, which are a newer type of phishing attack that needs to be uh, needs to be addressed pretty seriously. We'll talk about multi-factor authentication and some of the risks that are involved with that and uh, implementation strategies, authentication devices, and we'll go through some information on biometrics and the, the future of authentication based on kind of who you are and what you have as, uh, as your own personal types of authentication that can't be uh, you know, forged like a password. So as Natalie mentioned, my name is Matt Duran. I am the incident response team manager and a senior security consultant with LMG Security. I am a, a black hat instructor and co-author of the data breaches and ransomware courses. Uh, I'm also the lead of research and development with LMG Security, and uh, as we'll talk about as we go through the presentation, I am evil sometimes. Today I'll be good though, I promise you that. So let's have a serious talk about passwords. How do you feel about passwords? And we'll just throw this out there as something to consider. Do you love passwords? Do you hate passwords? Do you feel indifferent about passwords? 
I know my personal thoughts on the concept of passwords and the fact that we've all kind of grown up using them for online services. But uh, I feel like there are some some things that we can do with passwords to make them a little bit more effective, a little bit easier to remember, and a little bit less of a hassle for uh, the employees of our organizations or the users of our services specifically. So we have a, an intrinsic need for strong authentication. This is something that uh, is, is you know general to cybersecurity and security in general. And when we're talking about authentication, we're talking about the the methods that we verify that you are who you say you are or who you who you're purporting to be at this point. Strong authentication is needed in a number of different uh, facets throughout our, our digital life, including things like online banking logins for both web and mobile. There are some pretty interesting ways that that gets accomplished. Employee and vendor logins for both cloud services, email, workstation logins. Uh, customer phone interactions, uh, again, are something that requires a pretty sophisticated level of authentication and has its own set of considerations to take in. And uh, customers' communication systems also come into play here. So when we're talking about authentication, we really like to break that down into three unique categories. We have something you know, something you have, and something you are. And when we refer to the term multi-factor authentication, really what we're saying is using more than one of these at the same time to uh, provide authentication to your uh, your application or your service or whatever it is you're 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 using this kind of system for. So we'll start off with the uh, the baseline. This is the something you know type. And of course, this comes down to passwords. Uh, since passwords are, are the baseline, I figure it's probably good to get those uh, addressed pretty early in the presentation. So there are some pros to passwords. I mean, they are a, a, you know, a normal part of any kind of authentication process. Everyone is used to entering usernames and passwords. It's not something that's going to come as a, a shock to everyone. They're easy to deploy. There is usually no hardware required, and they are a low-cost solution, normally free for a lot of web services, including things like yeah, G Suite and Office 365. I mean, password is the you know the, the baseline method of getting into a system. There are some cons that we have to associate with those as well, though. Uh, passwords unfortunately tend to be weak and are easily guessable. We've made passwords into this kind of uh, weird paradox where they are really really hard for humans to remember, but very easy for hackers to guess using some pretty rudimentary toolkits. So there are some things that we can do to uh, to make that a little bit easier. Uh, so this this really becomes uh, very important for us, especially in the post-COVID-19 landscape. Uh, what we see here is a uh, graph about the continuation of online services that have been kind of put into play because of the work from home push. Uh, we can see that a number of people responding to this IBM security survey have uh, indicated that they plan on uh, continuing to use online video conferencing and online services uh, for a, you know, a large portion of their communication after the COVID-19 pandemic is finally over. We see 55% uh, anticipate one to five uh, video conferences per week, an additional 20% see six to 10 video conferences per week. Uh, I don't know about uh, you as a listener, but I know that a good portion of my day, pretty much daily at this point, is video conferencing. So Zoom, Teams, GoToWebinar, whatever that might be. It's becoming a daily part of our, uh, our, our office life, and it seems to be replacing in-person meetings in a lot of different ways. So as we mentioned, there's been a rapid change due to COVID-19. Uh, the graphs you see in front of you show the business impact according to the change in workflow that had to be facilitated because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we can see that 37.5% of IT professionals surveyed in this MariahDB survey said that the COVID-19 business impact was very impactful. 40% said extremely impactful. So that's a vast majority that are showing a lot of differences and a lot of new changes that need to be made based on this. Uh, we can also see the problems that are coming in from these uh, these specific kinds of moves. So 31.8% of people said they were starting to move to the cloud because of this. Uh, they were moving applications to the cloud. There was a goal to be 100% cloud-based. That's great, and it's a, uh, it, it's a very uh, streamlined way to run your business operations. But there, again, are some security considerations that need to be brought into account, especially when it comes to authenticating those services and maintaining the safety of the data that you're choosing to store there. Now we say safety of your data as a, as a pretty good precursor to the next slide. Your data is basically here when you move to the cloud. And I know this slide looks a little bit overwhelming. I promise you that's on purpose. Uh, these are a number of services, by no means all of them, but a number of services that are in use for data storage, communications, and other business critical operations that are now cloud-based. And a lot of people are uh, relying very heavily on these services to kind of maintain their daily operations now that the work from home uh, kind of model of operation is very normal and it has become kind of an essential part of a successful business. 
when we're talking about using cloud services though we really need to be clear uh cloud services are great but we need to remember there really is no cloud this is just other people's computers instead of storing your data on a local file server you're basically storing your data on a file server in southern california and the same uh, security considerations that you would take into play for your on-premise uh, security and applications needs to be in place for these cloud services too they're not magic although we all kind of wish they would be uh, but taking just a few of these uh, these basic steps to make sure we have security locked down, make sure we have authentication in a robust and easy to use fashion, greatly reduces the chance of a data breach and makes all of the users of our system a lot happier. It's a, just a lot easier to use. So credential stuffing attacks seem to be the biggest problem we see with cloud-based services at this point. And if you use something like Office 365, I can almost guarantee you that probably right now, you're the target of a credential stuffing attack. We do testing in our malware lab to uh, to kind of test out these uh, attack functions, how they're coming into the Office 365 tenants, you know, what kind of tactics are actually being used. And based on my experience, if I spin up a brand new Office 365 tenant, I have maybe 10 minutes of peace and quiet on the back end of that system. And then the credential stuffing attacks start coming in on the back end. And they're coming in from all over the world. They're using, uh, you know, largely stolen password lists. And the entire goal is just to get into that organization. And there's a number of reasons why people do that. But it's something that, uh, that needs to be, uh, you know, top of mind when it comes to security. So credential stuffing attacks, again, are, are massive, and the FBI has seen a, a huge spike in credential stuffing attacks over the last two years, specifically over the last about nine months or so. Uh, my favorite part about this, and I had to throw this headline in here, Bill Gates predicted the death of passwords, uh, saying that traditional password-based security was headed for extinction. And if we look at the date on that article, it's February uh, 25th of 2004. Now, uh, obviously, we are long past 2004, and uh, I, I'd like you to just take a mental note of the number of services that you utilize that require nothing more to log in than just a username and password. The reason this becomes a problem is that passwords are for sale everywhere. Uh, recently, it was discovered that 15 billion compromised credentials were available for sale in a hacker form on the dark web. A company called Digital Shadows found that out, uh, and from LMG's malware lab, we can verify there are a number of compromised password lists that uh, that we've checked out over the uh, over the years and they are they are really everywhere they are not hard for people to get a hold of and the number of passwords being uh being exposed in these kind of uh, sales and attacks is really problematic mainly for the simple fact that passwords are reused by a number of people uh there is a a trend that we see when we look at the number of passwords that are compromised in these accounts uh a lot of them are duplicates, so we'll see passwords that are used for things like Facebook and Twitter, also reused for professional services like Office 365 and G Suite. This obviously becomes a big issue because if one of those services gets compromised, all of those services then become compromised. Now, when we talk about credential stuffing attacks, what we're talking about is a very specific kind of cyber attack. Essentially, criminals will steal passwords or buy them on the dark web and then try them everywhere they can that accepts username and passwords on the uh, usernames and passwords on the internet. They'll try personal sites, they'll try work sites, and they can do this all with a series of automated toolkits that are normally either free or low cost for the hacker to operate. Uh, it becomes a, a very trivial issue for them to basically just put a list of words into one of their programs, hit go, and then come back a few hours later and see if anything was successful. And at this point, odds are good they're probably going to find something if they engage in that kind of attack. Brent Arsenault from Microsoft uh, puts this in about the, the best way that I could possibly describe it. Hackers don't break in, they log in. And this is the, the standard method of compromise when we're talking about cloud-based services. This isn't a sophisticated hacker toolkit. These aren't uh, you know zero-day server attacks or anything like that. It's literally just people with lists of usernames and passwords, spraying them out across the internet and seeing where they can get a successful hit. Strong passwords become the kind of baseline level of defense for this type of attack. And when we talk about strong passwords, what we really mean is unique passwords. That determination needs to be made. It doesn't matter if you're using a 25 character password with all of the NIST standard uh, kind of bells and whistles to go along with it. If that same password is used on 20 different services and one of those services is compromised, now all of those services are compromised. What we recommend is a unique password for every web service that you use. And I know that can be a little daunting because it is tough to keep track of these passwords. We also recommend that the passwords be long or pass phrases more accurately. Uh, complexity is not really required per NIST guidelines anymore. They've, uh, they've rolled that back since, according to a lot of people, NIST kind of ruined the password for everyone. Uh, but we say with a long passphrase, uh, hit a 14 to 16 character minimum for a standard user account. We'd actually recommend upwards of 25 for an administrator level account. 
uh, and make sure that uh, that you're auditing passwords, that people are, are conforming to these password requirements and not practicing bad password policies uh, that, that then put your organization or their personal data at risk. Again, we, we don't want people to use the, uh, you know, a 12 character password, even if it has the uppercase, lowercase, letter, symbol, all of the other stuff to go along with it. Shoot for length uh, over complexity. I mean, keep them complex, obviously, but don't kill yourself trying to do it. This brings us to the concept of the passphrase. So passphrases are my preferred method of, uh, of basically using a word-based password. Uh, we can see on the left-hand side some common examples of passwords, Samuel123, Monkey399, with uh, some characters you know, replaced with numbers. These are great, and it's what people associate with passwords, but a lot of these are really hard to remember, or at least keep track of. As opposed to that, we, we recommend the passphrase. So a sentence or a song lyric or, or something like that can be a much more uh, secure level of, uh, of complexity of a password without really making it that much more difficult to remember. So something like uh, I can <laughs> I can see them y'all or I love ice cream uh, really does make for a good password uh, as long as it is still unique and still maintains that long level of, uh, of character length. Also, easier to remember. I can't stress that one enough. This also becomes important because an easy to remember password means that you probably won't have to reset that password as often. Uh, this was a study done earlier this year, which was the overall cost of password resets for a standard enterprise operation. Uh, per person each year, uh, we look at about 21 hours of lost uh, of lost work time based on password resets alone. 20 to 50 percent of help desk calls are for password resets, and this brings us up to an average of about $70 every time a user in your organization needs to reset their password. That's a significant uh, drain on resources, on time, on pretty much everything that could be uh, could be funneled into more productivity for your workforce, and it is the number one support cost. Uh, basically uh, across enterprises as a whole. Password reuse, again, as we mentioned, is also a, a big problem. This is a study that was done by Google, uh, giving us just kind of a basic rundown of some common uh, bad password practices that are, are common across the cybersecurity landscape. 52% of users polled admitted to reusing the same password for multiple but not all accounts across their online services. 13% uh, reuse the same password for every single account. So overall, that puts us above two thirds of users or right at two thirds of users who are reusing passwords. That is a frightening statistic to look at. Because again, it means that if, uh, if something goes wrong with one of those passwords or if one of those sites is compromised that's out of your control, it could potentially make it uh, your organization's problem because of bad password usage. And we've all seen this before. Uh, this is a, a you know a list of kind of what those bad password practices might look like. So you can see three of the uh, four services here are all the same password. The fourth one is uh, the same password, but with a one on the end. I can promise you just adding a one to the end or uh, changing one letter to a number or something like that is not really going to be a sufficient method for stopping password stuffing attacks. Uh, the automated toolkits that our pen test team uses uh, have built-in functions that'll go ahead and make those changes to passwords for them so they can check and see if you've done something like add an exclamation point at the end or change the year or something like that. Uh, again, it is, uh, it, it's a good try to, to keep your passwords unique, but that's not quite what we're going for. So when we're talking about managing passwords, uh, here's what really makes this into a problem. Uh, the this is a, a survey from Ubico that was uh, about pa uh, people who don't use a password manager and the methods they use for actually you know, keeping track of these things. 53% of these password or, uh, respondents said that they remember their passwords just using their own memory. What that says to me is that they're using the same passwords or they're using slight variations of one single password so that they can remember them all as they move through. 32% of users save their passwords in a web browser. Now, if you're uh, familiar with uh, web browsers like Google Chrome and Firefox and you know Edge or pretty much any web browser at this point, you're probably fam uh, familiar with going to a website, entering a username and password, and having a little box pop up on the upper right-hand corner of the screen that says, would you like to save the password for this website? Now, on its surface, that may seem like a really great idea. I mean, it's, it's basically keeping track of your passwords for you. You no longer have to remember these things. It'll automatically populate when it comes to one of these new websites. All you really have to do is go to the website, click login, and you're done at that point. And that's that's great. And again, a very attractive solution for a lot of people. We'll show you in a second why that's a bad idea. Uh, we also saw 26% of people using spreadsheets, clear text spreadsheets on their computers, 26% manually write them down on, on sticky notes. Uh, these are, are probably the lowest security methods that you can maintain for, for keeping a list of passwords. If your computer is compromised in any way, especially by an information stealing Trojan, one of the very first things that those will steal are clear text documents, then your passwords are out the door. 
uh, you're, you're done at that point. And as far as sticky notes go, uh, there are a number of pages on uh, on social media sites like Twitter who specifically call out and shame people who have their passwords uh, stuck to the front of their monitors. We see this in a lot of retail organizations where right behind the front counter, the cash register itself will have an administrative password on a sticky note, uh, and that that is absolutely not a secure way of, of doing business. Okay, so back to the uh, back to the browsers. When we're talking about saving passwords in a browser, again, that may seem like a, a pretty safe. Uh, alternative to writing your passwords down or keeping them in a spreadsheet, but that's becoming more of a target for malware. Uh, what you see in front of you is a network capture that came out of LMG's malware lab. We were running some tests on the Emotet Trojan, and one of the things that we noticed with Emotet is that Emotet was stealing passwords from web browsers, and this one actually came through in clear text so we could see exactly when it came through and exactly where it went. Uh, but you can see the username and password were scraped directly out of Google Chrome. We had these saved for an Office 365 login. Now, luckily, we had changed the password prior to detonating the malware in our lab, uh, but we were able to sit and watch the increase in uh, attacks against this account specifically. So that, that gave us a really good indication that this password was stolen from the account and then almost immediately put to use trying to break into our uh, our mock email tenant at this point. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a, a again, a frightening concept for uh, for a lot of people. So we we have an alternative for you that I think might be a better idea. Password managers. Now, these have come a long way since password managers became kind of their their initial uh, entity in the cybersecurity landscape. Uh, what you see here is a screenshot of LastPass, which is a, a very good password manager. There are many others like it, including things like Dashlane and 1Password. These basically allow you to keep all of your uh, secured passwords in a secure repository. They're encrypted, they're protected by a master password. Uh, our recommendation is that you put uh, multi-factor authentication on these password vaults as well. But this basically means that if somebody does manage to get into your system, they don't have access to your password lists. So the passwords that you've saved for things like Amazon or Facebook or your business critical applications are secure and uh, out of the reach of a hacker at that point. And they're normally pretty cheap, uh, three to $4 per user per month. Uh, and uh, again, using multi-factor authentication on these things is, is critical. They also allow you to generate passwords, which is a really helpful function to have in, a, in a, uh, an application like this. You can just tell it the length of password that you want, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, symbols. It can create these incredibly long, incredibly complex passwords that you now don't really have to remember because the application is gonna keep track of that for you. And again, these these are stored in an encrypted vault. Uh, this makes it very, very difficult for uh, anyone to access that if they don't have your master password and your multi-factor authentication key. Not to say that that's a bulletproof security measure, but it's pretty good, especially when compared to something like keeping it in a web browser. Uh, this also gives you the opportunity to share passwords. Now, sharing passwords has always been kind of a, uh, a, a difficult topic to approach with people. As a general security practice, we don't want people to share passwords. We want them to maintain their own lists, have their own unique logins, but we all know from a business standpoint, sometimes that's not quite possible. There are some services where your entire organization may only have one user account, but multiple people who need to access that system. Password managers can uh, accommodate that for you by sharing that password with only a very specific group of people and allowing anyone within that uh, that group to change the password and update the rest of the group as to the, the new password's uh, length, complexity, and format. Uh, it makes the sharing system a lot more secure. Again, we still prefer people have their own logins, but in the case that you can't, this is a pretty viable alternative to that. Okay, so we've talked about passwords uh, at length now. I, I hope everyone got a good rundown from uh, of, uh, of what we're talking about there. Uh, but let's move into something that's, uh, that's a little more secure than just the password. And here we get into the second portion of authentication. This is the something you have method. Uh, when we're talking about something you have, this has to do with a, a code you might maintain, a multi-factor authentication application, something like that, that will allow for a second step before full authentication to your account is available and granted to a user. So when we talk about multi-factor authentication, we can actually go pretty far back in history to the first kind of methods of multi-factor and why they became an important thing. So the first ATMs are actually a lot of the uh, a lot of the base for where this multi-factor kind of concept came from. Uh, Barclays Bank in uh, Enfield was one of the first banks in the world to actually put out an automated teller machine or an ATM. Uh, this was in 1965, and basically the way they would work these. Uh, people would go to the bank on, say, a Friday, and they would tell the bank, I need 50 quid for the weekend. And the bank would write them a slip that would authorize them to pull that 50 quid out of an automated teller. The person could then come back, they could deposit that slip, and they could get their 50 quid. Now, the problem here is that if somebody lost that slip that the bank gave them, they probably also lost that money because anyone who picked up that slip 
could go to an ATM and withdraw that money without any kind of uh, any kind of block in place. So a couple of banks uh, a couple of years later decided that they would take a uh, kind of a secondary method of authentication here. They would give the client a slip, but they would also give them a personal identification number. So now the client had to have the pin and the slip to make that withdrawal. The problem that we ran into here is most people would just write that number down on the slip. So if they lost the slip, the pin and the slip were gone. The same problem is still there. Uh, this was uh, brought into a more modern situation later with banks where we started using the card and the pin number separate from the card. Again, it, it goes back a while, but it's kind of an interesting sequence of events that led to the first kind of pieces of multi-factor authentication being put into a secured system. Uh, the good old ATM. So for secure tokens now, we've uh, we've come a long way. Uh, we're, we're talking about things that uh, can generate a one-time password for you that change every minute, every 30 seconds, depending on which one you're using. Uh, in some cases, these are independent hardware devices like an RSA key fob, which I'm sure uh, most of you are probably familiar with at this point. This can also be a multi-factor authentication application, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But basically, the idea is you put your username and password in, and then you need to enter the uh, appropriate code from the device that you have along with your username and password to successfully authenticate against the system. This greatly reduces the chance of someone being able to guess that code because it changes every minute. Much more secure way of going about things. We've also got systems like the YubiKey. And uh, the YubiKey is a, is a great piece of hardware that uh, essentially allows you to log into web services without needing to actually type in a, a username and password. All of this gets stored into this, uh, this hardware device and the device handles the authentication for you. Uh, to access your websites, you do have to have your unique YubiKey. It has to be configured for you specifically. Uh, and if, a lot of these can also be encrypted and password protected. So if you lose the YubiKey, uh, you don't necessarily lose all of your passwords, which of course becomes very, very important for a lot of people. Works with a lot of traditional applications too. So Google accounts, Facebook accounts, GitHub, Docker, Dropbox, Salesforce, uh, LastPass itself, Dashlane. A lot of these can be used with the YubiKey for an additional layer of security. Now, I mentioned previously, we uh, we had talked a little bit about multi-factor authentication applications and how those have become a kind of a mainstay in uh, cybersecurity and in just general authentication security uh, for the modern day. There's a reason for that, too. A lot of these run on smartphones. Uh, this is a survey that came out of Statista for uh, 2011 through 2019. They were able to come to the conclusion that about 81% of U.S. adults use a smartphone. And a smartphone can be a great conduit for multi-factor authentication. Uh, there are a couple of different ways we can go about that. Multi-factor authentication applications are one. There's also SMS-based uh, authentication. So you're logging into a website and having them text you a code or something like that. Now, take a quick minute to think to yourself, how many of you log into a system that sends you a text message with a PIN number directly to your phone? If you do or you don't, uh, this should be something that is a reasonably familiar concept to a lot of people. I know that uh, even with the advanced security precautions that I use on a lot of my accounts, there are still some services out there that allow for SMS messages to be used at that, uh, as that multi-factor authentication code. Realistically, we'd prefer to not use that method, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Using two-factor authentication, uh, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, using SMS-based two-factor authentication is better than not using two-factor authentication. But relying on the cell phone text-based chain to receive those codes can be problematic for a couple of reasons. First off, there are uh, multiple instances of cell phones being hacked by malware. I mean, that is, a, that is a, you know, a, a pretty normal thing that we see anymore, especially with the newer digital landscape. Cell phones are little computers, and they are a massive target for hackers going after your, uh, your personal information. Uh, NIST has actually come out and stated basically that uh, the age of SMS-based two-factor authentication is over. Now, they stated it was over in 2016. They've since rolled that back a little bit, but uh, NIST is, uh, is kind of on board with this. We'd, we'd like to try to avoid using SMS for, uh, for, for obvious reasons here. First off, SIM swapping becomes a big problem. Now, uh, SIM swapping, if you're not familiar with the term, is where an, uh, an unauthorized person, whether through your cell phone carrier or some other method, manages to basically hijack traffic that's coming into your cell phone. And they can do this by contacting your phone company, pretending to be you, and asking for your specific phone information to be redirected to a new device. Uh, they can also uh, basically clone your cell phone and get all the information that's coming in with it. There are a few different ways that this can be, be done. And as I mentioned before, malware attacks against mobile devices are also booming in 2019, and uh, 2020 I don't anticipate will be any better. 
uh, essentially they're they're gaining access to your phone, and once they have access to your phone, they can read your text messages. Again, this means that if you're relying on your phone to deliver that multi-factor authentication key just through uh, an SMS message, hackers can intercept that SMS message, basically uh, steal your two-factor key at that point, and log into your accounts. It's a more difficult process than just scraping your passwords, but it is still something that we see in uh, in some pretty high-profile cases uh, in in the last few years. We also have to be wary about old infrastructure flaws. So this is the uh, the SS7 flaw, which uh, SS7 refers to a specific protocol that mobile devices use to basically communicate in between networks from different carriers. So uh, going from an AT&T network to a Verizon network, the traffic isn't exactly the same. They need to use this, uh, this communication protocol to kind of uh, translate the data between those two. And it's been in place since the early days of cellular technology. This has been actively exploited uh, on a few different occasions by some pretty high profile cyber criminal groups. Uh, criminals were able to use the SS7 flaw to hack a number of bank accounts in Germany, specifically by intercepting those one-time passwords and gaining access to those accounts. So again, something that we need to watch out for and something that needs to be, uh, to be taken pretty seriously. Instead, we recommend using an authentication application. Uh, these are cheap and easy options. They're oftentimes free. They're made available by a number of reputable vendors out there. Uh, and they are, uh, they're, they're a very safe way of uh, receiving those codes. So we're talking about things like the, uh, the Azure Microsoft Office 365 authenticator, uh, Google's multi-factor key, uh, Duo is a really good one. RSA makes a very robust solution. And basically these connect to your account. When you go to log into one of your online services, a signal is sent to your cell phone, uh, basically verifying that it's you. It'll pop up a little message that say, do you approve this sign-in? You hit okay and approve. There's your multi-factor step right there. The actual codes that are being used are encrypted on the back end of the process. So even if your phone is hijacked for some reason, those codes are not necessarily available to someone who has taken control of your advice. So best practices for multi-factor authentication. Uh, we Again, we recommend using a strong multi-factor authentication standing. That means using an application, not SMS-based authentication. We recommend turning that off as, if it's possible. Uh, and we also recommend that you check with your cloud providers and make sure that multi-factor authentication like this is an available service. Most cloud providers will offer this just as a general add-on to, uh, to their basic software suite as a, kind of a default now. Uh, those that don't are a bit behind the times and probably need to catch up. I, I'm not saying you should cancel those services, but putting pressure on them to enable these services is in everybody's best interest at this point and something that uh, I, I think should be looked at. Now, multi-factor authentication, unfortunately, is not a silver bullet for stopping all kinds of attacks against your system. Uh, we've started to see a new type of phishing attack emerge recently uh, called, a con or, uh, called a consent phishing attack. These are pretty sneaky, and we've seen a couple of them come through uh, the LMG lab where we've been able to track exactly what the attackers are doing, uh, what they're trying to get to, and how they're able to get into your, uh, your systems using these. Basically, it'll look like this. You'll get an email from someone saying that, uh, you know, a basic phishing email format, saying that there's a document for you to review. They'll instruct you that the document was created using, you know, an online version of Word or a mobile version of Word or something like that. And they'll try to get you to click on a link. When you click on that link, a, uh, a window will pop up on your screen asking you to allow consent for an application to access your account. And they'll be asking for things like the ability to log you in and log you out, the ability to view your contact lists, to read files that you have access to, and basically to manipulate and interact with everything that's in your tenant. If you click yes on that, the attackers now have full access to your account and they don't actually need your username and password to log in. They're logging in on the back end using what's called an OAuth key. Uh, the other kind of uh, really frightening thing about this kind of attack is that this is effectively a multi-factor authentication bypass. There is gonna be no multi-factor prompt when someone logs into your account using these uh, consented applications to stop them from getting in. They basically have full access and uh, even if you change your passwords, they can still oftentimes access the accounts using that authorization key that you provided. So again, uh, a new type of phishing attack that's very important to be aware of and, uh, and something that your employees need to be educated about uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we we want to make sure that people aren't getting hacked this way because it, uh, it becomes a very difficult attack to stop. So lastly, we'll talk about the, uh, you know, the future of authentication and uh, what this really means for the cybersecurity landscape. And that's the something you are portion of uh, the the authentication catalog, uh, as we're as we're calling it here, and when we talk about something you are, I mean it's it's really exactly that. It is it is you specifically that is authenticating against the account. So we're talking about things like your biometric signature, your voice signature, uh, you know behavioral indicators about how you normally use a computer system, 
uh, the device that you're actually using to log in. There's a number of things that uh, that security vendors can look at to kind of verify that it is actually you logging into an account. So first off, let's talk about call center fraud. When we, we talk about call centers, uh, a lot of times when we call into a, let's say, a credit monitoring company or a, a financial institution, they ask a number of questions that will essentially uh, authenticate whether we are the person calling in. We call this knowledge-based authentication. So they're going to be things like the model of the first car that you had a, uh, a you know a business loan on, or uh, sorry, an auto loan on, uh, the street of the uh, the business that you work in, your first uh, your first full-time employment uh, provider, things like that that uh, realistically only you should know uh, that are uh, kind of kept on a back-end list. These all sound great because this is all pretty specialized information. It may not be regularly available if somebody's just Googling you, but there's there's a problem for this. Does anyone remember the Equifax hack uh, that happened a few years back and the, the number of uh, personal records that were stolen from Equifax? I certainly do. I was I was one of the people who was actually involved in this breach. I got a notification letter from them letting me know that my uh, my information had been potentially compromised. Uh, Equifax is a major vendor of the answers for these so-called knowledge-based authentication questions. So it kind of uh, goes without saying that if Equifax lost a large uh, kind of swath of personal data on the people that it was keeping track of in its, in its system, those knowledge-based answers probably went out the door as well. So just having that information is not quite not quite a good enough solution at this point. We also have to look at things like the OPM uh, and Anthem. Anthem was another one of these uh, these data aggregators that was hacked and had uh, 80 million records uh, or 80 million individuals' records stolen from them. All of this is very very personal information, and all of this can be used to bypass those kind of roadblocks that are put in place by an institution trying to authenticate you based on simply what you know, rather than a uh, you know a specific password or key fob or something like that that you're you're using. Something to keep in mind. Not not meaning to scare you too badly on this one, but uh, you know it is it is something that we have to talk about. We also have to talk about call centers and how they authenticate you when you call in based on based on other features that are not you know answers to questions, things like your voice or your device fingerprint. This is where we come into these kind of biometric forms of authentication. So when we're talking about biometrics, I mean, realistically, we're talking about things like signature recognition, facial recognition, fingerprint recognition, uh, DNA, vein patterns, and voice recognition. All of these are, are pretty common and are becoming a lot more uh, a lot more widespread in their deployments for uh, just authentication in general. Behavioral authentication, I think, is my favorite one at this point. It's actually looking at the way that you type, uh, common misspellings that you might weigh or make, the speed at which you complete uh, forms on a website to basically uh, identify if the person who's pretending to be you types like you, or if they type much faster or much slower, misspell different words, have uh, you know non-native language indicators in their typing. It's it's pretty cool how this all works. So here's an example of uh, voice-based authentication. This is from the liar or from uh, the Liarbird application, and this is actually how voice-based authentication can go wrong. Uh, I'm sure we've all utilized the uh, the Siri systems or the Alexa systems or you know the the voice-based uh, you know smartphone applications, and those are very cool. But those can actually be spoofed, and uh, it, it's realistically not that difficult to do that. Uh, Liarbird is an application where you can submit audio files and then basically create a fake voice based off of those audio files. So by submitting a uh, specific uh, set of keywords and phrases, Liarbird can effectively recreate how you would say something. And Liarbird uh, from uh, Black Hat in 2018 was actually able to fool both Siri and Microsoft's speech recognition API in a pretty quick period of time. I mean, this was uh, this was a really interesting uh, experiment to watch, where based on just a couple of uh, kind of bypassed recordings, researchers were able to configure this fake voice and gain access to a computer system that they shouldn't have otherwise had access to. Phone printing is another really interesting method of this, uh, you know, uh, something you are type of application. Um, and this is becoming a, a more common method of authenticating, uh, authenticating you when you call into a, uh, a vendor or someone like that for service. Uh, I know that when I call into, say, my, uh, my internet service provider, based on the data they get from my phone when I call in, they can know who I am and basically have my account information ready to go. And that uh, that information they're pulling from your phone is not only just your your phone number, but also things like the make and model of your phone, the firmware revision of your phone, the specific uh, applications that are are uh, listed as being associated with that phone. They're creating a really unique kind of fingerprint for that specific device to authenticate that it is you. Now, if those uh, if that fingerprint can be replicated by someone else, obviously that becomes a problem. 
uh, and someone can call in and, and pretend to be you. But this is a very uh, a very kind of robust base level of security when we're when we're interacting with these kind of uh, these kind of companies. Obviously, other pieces of authentication need to go along with this. You'll you'll kind of get the uh, the trend I'm putting out here that multiple levels of authentication are always going to be better than a single point of failure. Uh, this is a, this is a perfect example of that. We also need to look at how customers authenticate you. Uh, so if someone is uh, is calling you for help, how do they know that they're actually calling you for help and not getting uh, sucked into a phishing scam or something like that? Here's a good example of uh, of how that can kind of go wrong. Uh, this was an individual who was involved in a financial services fraud uh, incident. Uh, so we'll call him Stephen Fru. Uh, his debit card was stolen. Uh, there were four fraudulent purchases made on the debit card. He actually got a call from the bank uh, talking to him about the fraudulent charges on his card, which I'm sure was a, a, a pretty welcome uh, piece of communication from him. What he didn't realize at the time, though, was that uh, the people who had stolen his card and were using this maliciously were aware of that phone call. So they called him back a second time claiming to be from his bank. They spoofed the caller ID number to make it look like they were calling from the same location and let him know that uh, they needed his security info to move his money to a safe account while they figured out what else was going on with his uh, with his account services. Now, uh, Stephen, of course, was probably uh, a little taken aback by this or off guard because he had just talked to his bank and he knew they were in communication with him. Didn't expect this to be hackers the second time around. They used that knowledge of his fraudulent payments to basically trick him into giving up that security information and stole $28,000 from the individual. Uh, again, that uh, that one specific piece of information that he didn't have was a way to verify he was actually talking to the bank at that point. Something to keep in mind, uh, there are some questions you can ask about, uh, you know, the people calling you to verify they are who they are. Uh, and it's, it's never a bad idea to get uh, verification that you're talking to the right people. Uh, all right, next up, we'll talk about biometric scanners. So these are really cool. Uh, biometric scanners have become much more kind of commonplace when we're looking at methods of identifying people in public. They're obviously gonna be talking about things like fingerprint scanners and uh, uh, iris scanning, retinal scanning. Uh, vein pattern recognition is another big piece of this. And we're starting to see these pop up in a lot more kind of uh, mainstream locations. So if you've uh, if you've been to an airport, uh, well, I guess if you had been to an airport prior to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really taking off, uh, you might have noticed the clear systems in place. And uh, the clear system is a, a recognition or a biometric recognition system that can be used basically as your ID when you're moving through security uh, in the airports. Uh, there are a number of other uh, options for facial recognition technology to be utilized for uh, this type of uh, identification of people as they're moving through large crowded areas. Facial recognition, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more here in a second, but is a, uh, a technology that has a lot of promise to it if they can get the security nailed down to a, uh, an acceptable level. Uh, Touch ID is another one that I think a lot of people are probably familiar with. Uh, Touch ID is just the, the concept of using your fingerprint to uh, either open your phone or authenticate with a device on your phone. So you can see these are all from uh, from an iPhone. Uh, this is the Discover application, the Mint.com application, and the Slice application. When you attempt to authenticate, they'll ask you for the uh, username and password, but also ask you to authenticate using your thumbprint on the device. Again, this is a, this is a very uh, secure method of authenticating against these systems because it's very difficult to recreate a live thumbprint. Uh, there are uh, not to say that it's not possible; it, it totally is, but it takes a lot of kind of setup to get yourself into a, a position like that. Now, the bigger problem we see with Touch ID, and it's it's also a problem with Face ID is the fact that while you do have to touch the phone uh, with your thumb, it doesn't necessarily have to be you that touches the phone with your thumb to make these authentications uh, go through correctly. And this is always the example I really like to bring up. Uh, this is a story about a child using their sleeping mother's fingerprints to buy Pokemon gifts using their iPhone. Uh, I'm sure the person thought they, uh, they had uh, set up a pretty robust security block uh, for you know, buying things through an online marketplace by using their fingerprint as kind of the key for it. But kids are smart and they will figure out that if they just use your thumbprint while you're sleeping, they can get into your phone and then they can play games and do really whatever they want. There's also some other uh, kind of more humorous uh, observations about uh, people uh, opening other people's phones while they're asleep on airplanes and then getting into fights over it. I don't want to go too far into depth on that one, but you can look up those stories on your own there. They're pretty entertaining. Uh, one of the other things that we really like to talk about is the the push to uh, new kind of uh, 
algorithmic based methods of, uh, of biometric authentication. And this is a good example of it right here. This is the Amazon One system, and it is a, a new innovation coming out by Amazon. It's not out on the market yet uh, in, in a large scale, but I'm sure we'll probably see it here after not too much longer. Uh, Amazon uses your palm print and some uh, measurements based on the distance between specific identifying features on your palm to authenticate that it's you. And it's, uh, it's more accurate than a fingerprint according to their documentation. Uh, and can be used basically just by passing your hand over the top of the device. Now, if this uh, if this device can be uh, implemented securely, and we we make sure that we're not opening up any uh, any kind of breach possibilities here, this is a really interesting way of quickly authenticating someone for things like a payment in a restaurant, or for verifying identification in an airport, or any of the other places where we need to go through these kind of stringent authentication functions. Uh, again, not rolled out in uh, in large scale yet, but We'll see what happens with it. This is definitely one I'm keeping an eye on. Uh, Windows Hello is another one that we need to bring in, and this is the facial recognition aspect of things. Uh, Windows Hello was supposed to be the end of the password era for Microsoft devices. I think if we've, uh, anyone who uses a Windows computer at this point knows that that's probably not the case for most people. I know the the Surface units tend to rely pretty heavily on facial recognition as a, as a method of authentication but it's not required and it's not uh, it's not the the only method of uh, of gaining access to these devices the password still exists for those uh, but the facial recognition aspect is uh, is interesting there are a number of researchers who have kind of made it their their goal to uh, thwart facial recognition systems um, using things like uh, you know a, a mask or facial prosthetics it's it's been proven that in some of the uh, lower tech systems, uh, facial recognition is able to be bypassed. Apple actually took a different approach to this as well. Their facial recognition is, uh, well, a very good solution. Uh, they had made a claim that uh, facial recognition would only respond to your face when it was alive, awake, and active. And they were, uh, they were kind of staking a claim on this based on the concerns that if you have facial recognition as an authentication method on your phone, if you fall asleep, someone can just grab your phone, point it at your face, and get into the device. Uh, Apple claimed that this was not possible, but it was uh, shown in uh, 2019 at Black Hat that there are some ways to get around this that were, were pretty interesting. Researchers for Black Hat were able to bypass this Face ID feature using what they called the Achilles heel. They had to use a really sophisticated piece of, uh, of uh, hardware to do this, though, uh, that we call a pair of glasses with black tape on it. Uh, and that, that's literally all they used to, to bypass this uh, you know, anti-sleep function on the, the Apple iPhone. By taking someone and putting these glasses on, it didn't matter if they were asleep or awake. All they had to do was point the phone at the person and they could uh, authenticate using the facial authentication features. Uh, again, not saying that it's uh, you know a broken system or anything like that, but nothing is perfect and we need to treat these things with the, the level of scrutiny that they kind of deserve. So what happens if your biometric data gets stolen? That becomes a big question for a lot of people. Uh, this is a, a firm out of uh, England that was breached, exposing uh, biometric records for 28 million users, including fingerprint and facial recognition data. Uh, that's obviously not something that we want getting out there as a piece of breached information. So this became kind of a big deal. I mean, what can criminals do when they have this uh, facial recognition data available to them? Uh, what what kind of nefarious acts could they get into? Could they uh, could they authenticate as you using some some pretty basic uh, kind of prosthetic features, uh, or is there something else that they're going after? Another example of uh, of facial recognition kind of gone wrong is Clearview AI, and I feel like we need to talk about Clearview because they're really a new uh, a new kind of avenue for this facial recognition uh, kind of market. And Clearview, if you're not familiar with the company creates uh, software for law enforcement agencies. And the idea behind their software is that by using a piece of video footage, they are able to look at the faces that are provided in that footage and identify all of the people that are walking through those, uh, those specific video frames using data that they've scraped from social media and from uh, other online sources. They have a massive database of facial recognition kind of root data that uh, is you know, out there for free on the internet. I mean, it's it's people who have shared photos to social media and have not locked down the permissions on them. Uh, Clearview took the unprecedented step and uh, kind of scraped all this data together to create this, what I consider to be a very intrusive database and a really questionable product. Uh, they actually suffered a breach not too long ago and their entire client list was, was pulled. This was interesting for a couple of reasons. I mean, Clearview works largely with law enforcement, which was not a surprise to anyone. But one of the things that was kind of a surprise was there were some big name retailers listed in their 
uh, in their client list who are piloting versions of this program. Now, we won't go into the names of the retailers specifically, but needless to say, that's that's kind of a frightening uh, prospect, knowing that if you walk into a department store or something like that, the security cameras within the department store could be watching you, tracking you, identifying you, and then attempting to market you uh, or market to you in a certain way, just based on the fact that you walked into the store. I, uh, I, I would kind of rather not have that be the case. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. Uh, the ACLU has actually sued the facial recognition firm for it, uh, for the product that they're putting out. They're calling it a nightmare scenario for privacy. Uh, and this lawsuit was actually brought in the state of Illinois, which is one of the few uh, states, in fact, it might be the only state, that actually has data breach and privacy laws that are specific to biometric data. Uh, the, the quote from the ACLU during the lawsuit was, uh, was pretty interesting. Uh, they stated that the company uh, Clearview AI will end privacy as we know it if they're not stopped. And I, they kind of have a point there, I would think. Uh, again, there's there's good uses for this kind of biometric authentication, and then there's also not so great uses for it. It's it's really up to the the industry to uh, you know maintain those clear ethical standards and make sure these aren't being used for something that's not really in the best interest of the technology and for the people that are being affected by it. All right, so to wrap up, password uh, login tips. The, we have our do's and don'ts. So for our do's, we do want to use two-factor authentication, and I cannot stress this enough for uh, for the people listening. Multi-factor authentication is probably the single most important thing that you can enable on an account to greatly increase its security posture. Again, it's not a silver bullet, but if you don't have it and it's available, run, don't walk, and get this enabled for everything you can. For larger organizations, this be, this can become a bit of a hassle because there are a number of users who will need to be, you know, a, adopt to this system. There's always the kind of stigma with multi-factor authentication that it's difficult to use or it's obtrusive or, it, you know, it's clunky and makes things harder than they need to be. That's fine. We're, if we're gaining this much security off of a very slight inconvenience of having to click one extra button to log in, I don't see any problems with recommending that as a rollout for everyone on a large scale. Second, we want to use unique passwords, not just strong, but unique. We want to make sure every web service that we're interacting with or every authentication service we're interacting with is being uh, is signed into with a unique username and password. This will help uh, credential stuffing not be as big of a problem as it currently is. We want to pick strong passwords. Remember, length is greater than complexity in most cases, so we want to make sure that our passwords are 14 to 16 characters at a very bare minimum, longer if possible. And uh, we want to use password managers wherever we can. These have become a very robust solution for storing passwords, for making sure that everything is being generated properly, and for making sure that your users have an easy interface to access these passwords for when they need to uh, get into their systems. That's why they don't have to keep them in a clear text spreadsheet on their desktop and risk having those passwords being stolen. The don'ts are, are pretty straightforward. Don't share your password unless, of course, you're using a password manager. Uh, don't reuse important passwords. Uh, make sure that uh, make sure again that the, your passwords are staying unique. Don't write your passwords down on a piece of paper and slap them to the front of your monitor. Uh, and don't store passwords and files on your computer unless they are heavily encrypted. I, I cannot stress that one enough. Okay, so that's our uh, our webinar for today. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll open it up for Q and A here in just a second. Again, my name is Matt Duran. Uh, some quick news items: we have some upcoming uh, cyber training classes that LMG will be running. These are virtual classes. Uh, we provide you with a uh, virtual host and uh, we, we do the entire class through Zoom. It's been a lot of fun. On uh, the 3rd of December, we have a ransomware response class coming up. It is a hands-on lab to teach you how to quickly identify uh, secure data and respond to a ransomware incident. Uh, if you register by November 3rd, you can still get the early, uh, early bird discount using the link that you see below here on the screen. And again, uh, my name is Matt Duran. Check us out on uh, Twitter. Check us out on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have a Breaking Breaches video series that we're going to be use, uh, releasing here uh, periodically. This is where uh, Sherry Davidoff, the CEO of LNG Security, and I will talk about uh, recent data breaches and uh, you know the kind of fun things that happen to them. Uh, and yeah, we'll open it up to questions at this point. Thank you all again. Thank you, Matt, so much for that insightful presentation. We do have a couple of questions, and I just want to remind our attendees that if you would like to submit a question, you can use the QA tab in the, the panel of your screen. So one question that we have so far is, why and when do you use a VPN? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. So uh, VPNs are, uh, are incredibly important when we're talking about remote access into a network. Uh, when we're looking at uh, specifically ransomware events, a lot of times what we'll run into is a remote desktop system that's been exposed to the public internet and uh, has been broken into using some kind of uh, production or uh, some, sorry, some kind of credential stuffing attack or something like that. 
uh, they'll break in through the remote, the exposed remote desktop and then use those credentials to move laterally throughout a, a network. A VPN system is a much more secured method of uh, basically securing that uh, that network endpoint. Uh, we can have users with a unique uh, set of access credentials for the VPN or VPN specifically. We can assign multi-factor authentication to the VPN. And uh, once someone is inside the network at that point, if they manage to break through that outer layer, they don't have the actual username and password they'll need to log on to any hosts within the network. So again, we're, we're talking about those multiple layers of security. If you have the ability to have a VPN on your network, I would highly recommend utilizing it. Yes, that sounds very important. Uh, thank you for explaining that. The next question is, do you have any suggestions on how to handle the weakest link employees that may save passwords or click on things you tell them not to? Yeah, uh, so there are uh, there are a couple of ways that, the, that we recommend kind of going about that. Uh, inevitably, within a large organization, you're going to have a few people in the network who basically have old habits, and as we all know, old habits die hard. These are going to be people that since the very beginning of, uh, of passworded uh, authentication have been storing their passwords in text files, in Excel spreadsheets, in whatever else we can possibly think of that's a you know a, an insecure method of storing those passwords. There's a couple of things that we can do. Employee education is a really big part of the uh, the transition to a secure workforce. Not only do we need to uh, to educate employees on the dangers of storing these passwords locally and uh, the the dangers of you know just bad password management in general, we also need to test against the employee's response to something like a potential phishing attack. So we we highly recommend running a uh, you know a social engineering uh, simulation against your environment. Uh, bring a company in that can run a phishing attack against your network and then let you know the users in your uh, in your network that tend to click on these things. Uh, we can target those users for a little bit more uh, education. We can make sure that we have policies in place to block those specific kinds of attacks from getting out. But really it's about awareness and education. That's uh, if we make the culture of security kind of the, the norm for a business, it makes it a lot easier to get uh, everyone in the business in line and make sure everyone's following these, these kind of you know, very secure protocols. The culture of security, I like that phrase. That sounds very <laughs> important. One last question, are any added challenges with many of us working from home? And what about our internet security and connections? Similar to the VPN question, but. Yeah, that is that is very similar to the VPN question, but uh, there's there's some uh, very special considerations that need to be taken for the the work from home environment. So uh, you guys can't see my entire office setup here, but when uh, when I have my uh, my work from home setup uh, configured, because just like most of you, I uh, I have a work from home office that uh, that I've been using pretty heavily for the last few months. Uh, I have my uh, my LMG provided uh, hardware and uh, connection on one completely separate system. Everything that's in my home network, uh, so my you know, daughter's iPad, my my wife's phones, those are all are contained on a completely segregated network, and uh, I, I keep those things blocked very specifically. Really, the the big thing that we need to remember though is uh, when you're working from home, you need to be treating the uh, the devices and the services you're using uh, as if you were using them from inside of your office. So we need to be very careful about who we let uh, near our computers when they're in an unlocked state. If we have company provided equipment, we don't want to be letting our family members or friends use those for, for non-work activities. Uh, we want to make sure, again, that we're not stapling passwords up to uh, you know, a pegboard or writing them on a sticky note and putting them on our monitors. I mean, it's, it's just the, the kind of general uh, you know, security, uh, the security practices we would normally use just slightly modified for home usage. Also for home networks, we want to make sure that, uh, that routers that are being used for home networks are secured with a, uh, you know, a strong password. Uh, prefer or preferably we'd be using like MAC address based authentication for those uh, those types of uh, access points. I know that's not quite a, a, a realistic option for a lot of people, but making sure that we're using uh, you know a secure long password for access, making sure that we're changing that password somewhat frequently, making sure that firmware is up to date on those devices. I mean, it's it's just your basic network hygiene practices, just you know for your home system. Right on, thank you. Thanks, Matt, for answering those questions. And I just wanted to let the attendees know that if you have additional questions, Matt is very reliable via social media. So you can get a hold of him on LinkedIn or email him and ask any other questions you may have. Once again, my name is Natalie Adams with LMG Security. We would like to thank everyone who attended this webinar. Please take a moment to fill out the survey afterwards and let us know what you think. The recorded video from this presentation will be made available to attendees and we will send out a notification once that video is live.
Thank you to everyone who attended and have a great day.